Hi, this is Mish Devre. You're watching Football 360. Hello again, a happy new year to you. 2013 is shaping up to be a big year in WA football. It's finals time for the Perth Glory Girls and the night series is only days away. Coming up this month, we go one-on-one -on -one with Perth Glory star Sasha Andrews. We chat to Football West CEO Peter Hugg about the State League salary cap and we catch up with Coach of the Year Paul Price. But first, despite going down at the hands of Melbourne victory last week, it's been a landmark year for the Perth Glory women's team. Let's look back on the season that was. Westfield W League semi-final between Perth Glory and Melbourne Victory at Nib Stadium was shrouded in controversy. After extra time, scores were locked at one all, even though Glory star striker and Matilda Kate Gill had plenty of opportunities to seal the match. The game went into penalties. And with scores at 3 all, victory striker Jessica McDonald stepped up to take her penalty, which glory keepers Caitlin Savage saved with her foot. But then, a controversial decision which will haunt the glory for months. The referee ordered McDonald to retake her penalty. Savage was deemed to have stepped off her line, but replays show that decision was unfair. McDonald converted to send Melbourne victory into their first home grand final against Sydney FC. Glory will now look to next season to make amends. There was a special celebration of female football in WA at the W League semi-final. The Singer Cup winning regional state under 17 squad and the Pan Pacific Masters gold medal winning Perth Strikers were on show to the crowd. And former WA Matildas Sandra Brittnell, Julie Clayton, Sharon Lovelace, Tracy Wheeler and Denise Lofthouse were awarded their Matildas caps from new national coach Hesterina DeRoos. One of the starlets in the Perth Glory women's side has been Canadian international Sasha Andrews. She tells Football 360 about her passion for the world game. Sasha, tell us why did you start playing football? My father uh, used to play for the Black Stars. He's from Ghana, so kind of he's in my blood. Um, he was a goalkeeper, and he had me outside barefoot at like three years old, with ragamuffin hair running around, <laughs> um, you know, stepping on twigs, so my feet got real tough early. And I'd watch uh, a whole lot of soccer on Sunday mornings with him that I didn't even remember until I got a bit older. So then I started playing club, and he coached my brothers, and I played on their teams, and I just fell in love with the game, and it was a goal to play for Canada, and I set it off. 
So who would you say is your most inspirational player and why? I would pick Christine Sinclair, who's um, a phenom in my country. She pretty much brought us from the bottom of the barrel to the you know to the top 10 in the world. Um, I got the privilege of playing with her since she was about 15 years old. She played for a different province than me, but we both joined um, with the national team at a young age. And um, she's just great on and off the field as a friend, great leader. Um, she's a conqueror on the field. She always gets it done for our country. So she's somebody that I definitely look up to still to this day, even though we're the same age. And what would you say is your football philosophy? Football is like the world to me because it's just round, it unites everybody. Um, soccer's taken me all over the world and uh, to meet so many different people, different cultures, different you know morals and values around. This ball is just, it brings a smile to everyone's face. And to me, I'm pretty humanitarian. I think that's a wonderful thing to smile. And uh, there's passion all over the world for the game. So that's why I play. If you weren't playing football, what would you be doing? Well, I would definitely be the next Beyonce. <laughs> just kidding. I would be uh, working with the youth program in some type of outreach just to help mentor kids, um, inner city children, stuff like that. Uh, get them out of where they're at inspire them to, to join a sport or help them with the little things in life. And what is the best advice you've ever been given? That just to find your passion because your passion makes you happy at the end of the day no matter what you do and everybody's on the pursuit of happiness in this world so I would say just find your passion and your dream and go for it and just use the simple word of, word of believe. Just believe in yourself, believe in your abilities, believe in your dreams. Addiction starts with a choice. Two thousand and twelve capped a remarkable year for Sorrento. The club won the Premiership and the State Cup, and their coach Paul Price took out the gong for Coach of the Year. Paul Price joins me now on Football Three Hundred and Sixty. Paul, a happy New Year to you. Welcome to another edition of Football Three Hundred and Sixty. The night series is only days away. How is the club? preparing and fearing for the pre-season tournament? Yeah, the, it's come around very quickly and uh, you know, we felt that the players, you know, as a lot of the other clubs have done as well, we got to the, obviously to the grand final. We just needed to give them that little bit extra time off and uh, we've only been back in training now for probably three and a half weeks. We haven't actually played a friendly. First games against Ashfield, you know, we'll obviously take it as uh, that first game, particularly as a, as a warm-up game and hopefully we can, we can win it, but obviously I don't want players getting injured. Any new faces or changes to the lineup compared to last year? We've lost two very good players in Michael Aspin and uh, Reese Vitiglia. They've moved on to other clubs and uh, John, obviously Johnny Mirko retired. So that was you know, three players out of a side. That's you know, a big loss. We've got players here trialling at the moment. You know, hopefully by the time the season comes around we'll have a strong squad again. The trusty and faithful, uh, the Harnwell brothers and, and Macca, they're obviously uh, starters in the squad this year. Uh, starters, <laughs> uh, yeah, certainly they, they, they're still with us, yeah, so just like everybody else, they're going to be fighting for a place in the side. Th they'll keep going for as long as their legs carry them, so you know, who knows, you know, if they, they, they could go for another two or three years yet. What is a challenge for you, uh, mainly this year? We're going to try and win the night series, whether it's a, a bit too soon for us, we'll find out. We've already won the cup twice, we're going to want to hang on to it and win it a third time. Very quickly, danger team, in your opinion, for 2013? It would appear that Bayswater have signed quite a few players, so they probably would be the, uh, at this moment, if they perform well, uh, then they could be the, 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 the team to, to everybody to beat. And of course they got somebody knocks in 30 goals a year for them, so uh, that's not a, bad, uh, not a bad player to have. Former Socceroos and Perth Glory defender Chris Coyne has been handed the reins at Bayswater City. He tells Football 360 his thoughts on the new challenge and the season ahead in 2013. You know, I've come straight out of the game with, like you said, working for some really good managers and, you know, in, inheriting some of their ideas as well. You know, I took some of the good stuff from each, each coach and left out the bad and hopefully that will turn me into a, into a decent coach. I don't think you're, um, you're necessarily made to be a coach from a player, but, you know, it's something that's always interested me. I've, I've been told since I was, I was young I was a bossy so-and-so and, you know, I just saw this as the next step. So um, I'm really looking forward to it. You know, it's a, it's a good progression for me. It's something I've always wanted to do. But the playing days aren't over. I haven't hung the boots up yet. I, I might hopefully pull them out at one point. 
coming straight out of professional football. I expected maybe I, my expectations were too high, but I have to be honest, everything we've sat down and discussed in the in the short time I've been here, just under two months, is, is all coming into fruition now. And, you know, I'm really grateful for the board and the committee for putting things together. You know, we're trying to implement the right things. And we're trying to bring another generation of footballer through and we're trying to, you know, take a team in the state league to the next level to establish it as one of the best clubs in the, in the state league. I'm more than happy with, with what myself and, and Stuart Moses, my assistant, have brought in through the help of, of Oriano and the club. We've added some good strength, some good quality, a lot of pace into the team, and hopefully that can produce an exciting, quick, you know, goal-scoring brand of football. We're really looking forward to the night series. It'll be my first competitive games as, as, a, as a first team coach, and you know, I'll be going in there like I do with everything, and I want to win, whether it's a five-a-side on, on the training pitch or or whether it's a game, I want to win everything I do. So um, I'm really looking forward to, to the night series and it being, being a competitive um, competition. Your thoughts for 2013, the season ahead? How is the team shaping up over the off-season into the, into the year? Uh, yeah, I mean, obviously we've, uh, we've lost a couple of players. Uh, with uh, Nick Viaggio having to go back to, uh, to America. I think Wilf Dinsdale's got to go back to England as well, so we've lost a couple of good players there. Uh, we've done a little bit of recruiting. Uh, we've got a, lot, a few more local lads that have come on board. Uh, we've got a little bit more experience on board as well and uh, we'll have a, probably three or four imports that will come in as well from around the globe. One from New Zealand and a, and a couple from England. Armadale is one of the hosting venues for the night series in 2013. What does that mean for the club? Oh, I mean, it's a fantastic for the club. I mean, there's a lot of work goes on behind the scenes and, and the fact that we've been given the right to host one of the, uh, host the night series is great. We're using the night series as part of the pre-season. Due to the draw that we've had, uh, don't, don't get me wrong, I would be disappointed if we didn't qualify from our group. Looking forward to the, uh, the, the better half of the year, avoiding the relegation hotspot where you sort of uh, flirted with it last year, that's obviously at the top of the agenda? Well, we are a shadow of a doubt. I mean, for us last year to, you know, against, probably against all the odds and with the recruitment of the players that we had, you know, nobody gave us a chance to even stay up and, and we did by hook or by crook, which was great. Uh, this year we're, we're hoping to, to move on a little bit from that. Uh, we're not saying we're going to be a top three team or anything like that, but uh, yeah, we would like to try and get some respectability and, and finish somewhere in the mid-table. Your thoughts on the danger team for 2013? The danger team? Well, well there's a few of them now, isn't there? You know, there's some, you know, a lot of these clubs have uh, recruited well. They've got some impressive coaches. Uh, they've got some good backing from sponsors and that. So, I mean, you look at Bayswater today, they're going to be a threat. I think Inglewood are going to be a threat. It'll be interesting to see while Mauro goes down at Perth with his uh, with his, his his new setup of the youngsters, which could be exciting for them. Uh, and I think Sterling have recruited well as well. So there's a it's it's going to be tough. And there's going, there's a, probably four or five teams that have got a chance of winning it. Introducing a salary cap in WA football has had its sceptics, but it's here to stay. We chat to Football West CEO Peter Hugg who tells us why it will help improve the game and why it will bolster WA football. We needed to take a decision collectively supported by the clubs and in many ways driven by the clubs to try and bring in some sort of constraint and that is what the cap is, is meant to be. And then we foresee that if we can uh, free up dollars in the tens and twenties of thousands of dollars is that money could be better spent on marketing and promotion, youth development, coach education and so on. Many of the clubs in the second division actually don't want to pay players and whilst we've got a sort of a token and allocation is that many are deciding not to pay the players for second division. For first division it's slightly more and then clearly for Premier Division. For Premier Division, it's around about $70,000 per club, and that equates to just over $3,000 per weekend. Now, not all clubs are paying that, and there's no obligation to pay the full $70,000. There have been a number of clubs that go down the step of professional contracts, and we, nor the clubs, or indeed the players, can't breach those contracts. Those contracts can be nullified if both parties agree. So what we've done is we've worked with the, the respective clubs. There is a, a one year, almost like a moratorium, so that if someone was earning more than the $400, then that needs to be abided by. But the total gross amount, they still need to work within. For every dollar that they spend over, is that they still need to make the system work. We received feedback and we listened and learnt and, and improved it. And that clearly was one of the concerns that we had, is that the ability to attract and the ability to retain our better players. 
But I think the reality is, is that our state league is a semi-professional competition. And so anyone who is playing in the salary, in, sorry, in the state league, it's almost a, a, an additional money and they should not be doing it as their primary source of income. It's not what it's there for. That's, and, and if that is the case, then they should, I'd be encouraging them to go elsewhere. There will be penalties and, and uh, punishments for breaches. And they may range from fines, loss of points, or ultimately to suspensions. We are asking all clubs to, to abide by the rules. And if they decide to step outside those rules and, and the perimeters of which the salary cap, then they will suffer the consequences. In many instances, we're relying on self-regulation. And it's almost you know a club committee and a treasurer and a coach and a and a club president saying we will not step outside these rules and I will not uh, risk my club being relegated. And I don't think any club president or committee wants that to happen. We will then be asking each of the clubs to submit their books, um, both pr prior to the uh, to the league and also on a regular basis if they if they have changes. And we will also be doing random you know, spot checks. And the thing is about this sport is that there's a, a great and very uh, active uh, grapevine. Where we think that there is uh, uh, potential evidence or enough to call a club in, we will be doing so. The other thing about the salary cap is that there are provisions made for uh, players to actually uh, be involved in other aspects of the game and, and so on. So whilst they may only be paid, for example, $400 to actually play, there are provisions to be actually be employed by the club for junior coaching, youth development, to become ambassadors, skill acquisition coaches, etc. So those provisions are there for the club to utilise first team players in other aspects of running the club. Before we go, don't forget to check out our new segment, Football 360 Extra Time, featuring special segments on Frank Farina. You know, I've always believed that the greatest players in the world are the most humble ones. And humility is, is, a, is something that Alessandro is, uh, has a lot of. And former Glory coach, Mish Diavre. Any interest on your part in coming back to Perth and Perth Glory at some point, Mish? Uh, probably, oh, yes, Jonathan, in, 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 in a word, yes. And that wraps up another busy month of football in the West. We'll be back again next month. Until then, it's bye for now.